And we're back and ready for our first speaker. Let's welcome Melanie and uh, let's all uh, hear what she has to tell us about the COVID-19 apps. Welcome, Melanie. We look forward to hearing from you. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for the invite. I think, uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to talk about the uh, topic that I'm talking about today. I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 contact tracing apps. Um, what do I have to say about it? Well, I mean, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am the CEO uh, and co-founder of Radically Open Security, which is a, a social enterprise in the uh, computer security space here in the Netherlands. And what I can say is uh, we have been uh, hired by the Dutch Ministry of Health uh, to do the testing, uh, basically the uh, crypto testing and also uh, the code auditing on the back end of the uh, Corona Melder, uh, which is basically the new Dutch Corona 19 app. We also do work uh, with the European Union, uh, also testing uh, several national COVID-19 apps, uh, including uh, Immuni uh, in Italy and uh, Protego in Poland, and uh, also uh, Trace Together. we've had a look at, and we're also going to be doing some testing also on the Google Apple Exposure Framework. So uh, we've got a lot to say, and I've only got 20 minutes to do it, so I'm going to try and be quick. Um, so I'm going to start with a really quick look at what is contact tracing. Um, contact tracing, of course, predates anything uh, you know, digital. Uh, there's been about 30 different notifiable diseases, and notifiable meaning that doctors are required to inform public health authorities when somebody is sick. Um, what typically happens is that uh, when you report yourself as being sick, then manual contact tracers you know, pick up to the telephone and actually talk to you, trying to figure out exactly where you've been, who you've seen, you know, at what time, and then they go manually to all of those different people, then, you know, tracing their history and then tracing their history, thus trying to figure out who is uh, potentially infected to make sure that those people can take uh, effective precautions, uh, whether that's uh, getting themselves formally tested or self-quarantining or uh, anything like that. So uh, what we need to keep in mind about manual contact tracing is that it is not anonymous at all. I mean, you, you know, somebody's physically calling you on the phone. Uh, you know, it could be that they're asking you nicely to do things like self-quarantine, or it could be that they're forcing you to do it. I mean, depending on the disease, if you have, say, Ebola, then of course, you know, it's not optional to quarantine yourself because this is a public health matter. And we do need to keep in mind that there's emergency powers that the public health authorities receive in these times. Now, we decided that we wanted to do digital contact tracing for a few different reasons. Uh, digital contact tracing is uh, essentially the same thing as manual contact tracing, except for the fact that we are implementing it in either a telephone or a kind of uh, mobile beacon, so a, a separate piece of physical hardware. This is digital contact tracing isn't meant to replace, uh, you know, manual contact tracing, but rather it is meant to accompany it. And the reasons why are quite simply because we don't have enough people uh, to do manual contact tracing. And on top of that, you know, our memory is a little bit wonky. So, you know, if you ask me, you know, who have you seen, you know, in the last 24 hours, I might know. I might forget. And if I was in public transit, I mean, how on earth would I know? Because it's just a bunch of strangers. So we have the idea that we can use our cell phones uh, to be able to send out uh, signals so we can tell who else has been close to us. So also, for example, in this public transit scenario that we can pick up these signals and then know. But there's a lot of requirements on contact tracing. Uh, you know, first of all, it has to not be less reliable than manual contact tracing. And on top of that, you have a lot of technical uh, requirements. It has to be easily and quickly deployable. Security and privacy is obviously uh, very important. It has to get used because if nobody uses it, it's not effective. Uh, and on top of that, issues like uh, how long, you know, how much is it going to drain your battery? How much bandwidth is it going to take? You know, these are all relevant issues. These contact tracing uh, apps can fuse multiple input sources, uh, Bluetooth, GPS, cell towers, Wi-Fi, uh, but, but typically uh, they use Bluetooth because it works indoors. Uh, it's fairly short range 
And uh, well, it, everything else is either doesn't work inside or the resolution is not uh, good enough to be useful. So there's two different kinds of protocols uh, in digital contact tracing, decentralized and centralized. Uh, decentralized protocols uh, typically uh, use a framework that was created by uh, Google and Apple, uh, which I'll speak about uh, in a, pretty soon. But first, just the basics about what a decentralized protocol is. Now, the idea is first, you have to install the app on your phone. This should be voluntary. Now, the app creates some secret keys uh, on the phone, and that essentially works as a seed for a pseudo-random number generator. The pseudo-random number generator generates a stream of uh, temporary IDs, and then you start broadcasting, beaming out these temporary IDs. Now, the other cell phones that are in close proximity hear these temporary IDs, and then they record them. Now, there's also a centralized bulletin board. <laughs> so what happens is if a person gets infected, they can voluntarily, again, self-report that they are sick, and then they can upload their secret keys to a server. At that point, then people can download the private keys of those who are infected. And then again, because it's pseudo-random, you can calculate this, check the temporary IDs that you've seen, and then see if it belongs to one of the affected people. At that point, your cell phone can do a risk computation, considering things like uh, how close was I to this person, how long was I exposed to this person, and then it computes your risk. And if it then determines that you're at risk, then you can voluntarily uh, take additional steps, such as requesting a doctor's phone call, you can quarantine yourself, or you can get tested. Now, centralized protocols uh, are similar. Uh, except for the fact that there is a centralized authority that is sometimes handing out the uh, temporary IDs and also that is sometimes actually doing the risk calculations. So uh, typically the way it, that it works with the centralized protocols is your cell phone uh, has the IDs uh, and then you encrypt the ID, which becomes your temporary ID. This could use either public crypto or, or symmetric crypto, depending on what, what country you're in. Um, at that point, when you are infected, you can self-report this time to the centralized authority. And then the centralized authority then can decrypt the ID, send out the notifications, and then the government is able to identify the people. Now, why is this a good thing? I mean, of course, on the downside, of course, you have to trust the government. <laughs> but uh, what's also nice about this is that if we need to, uh, for example, update the risk calculation algorithm, uh, they're very well informed of the current national situation, and they're very easily able to do this. So there also are also uh, advantages of the centralized protocol. Now, um, of course, in the real world, we have to implement all this. And most of us are using cell phones that are either Androids from Google or iPhones from Apple, uh, which means that we're primarily dealing with two large tech companies. Now, these two large tech companies banded together to create the Google Apple Exposure Notification API, G-A-E-N. Um, we are sort of required to use this API because, quite simply, uh, Contact tracing apps do not work on iPhone if you are not using this API. Sounds a bit strange. It's because this um, we're using Bluetooth and we're constantly listening, we're constantly receiving, and sometimes our phones go to sleep. And we need this API to be able to bypass you know, when we're on standby so we can continue to receive even though our phone is sleeping. That's why we need this API. So uh, on Android, uh, it does work, uh, but if we do want it, this to work, contact tracing to work on iPhone, we are required to use the Google Apple Exposure Notification API. As a result, uh, this is a decentralized uh, system, not a centralized one, and a lot of countries are yeah, you know, if they want a working app, they're basically forced to use this API. So a lot of the national apps have adopted this API, uh, and some of them have even switched over. So some examples of these decentralized APIs, um, are, sorry, COVID tracing apps are things like PAX from MIT, uh, DP3T from Switzerland, and also the Dutch Corona Melder. There's a few exceptions. Uh, there's always going to be a few that have to be a bit difficult. Uh, France is uh, doing their own centralized system, and also Singapore uh, is using Trace together, also with this uh, this beacon. 
So this all sounds great. I mean, you know, great, you know, digital technology to help us with preventing infection. But then the real world sets in. Now, the problem is with all of this, it doesn't always work. The first issue that we tend to have is false negatives. In order to detect uh, COVID using this app, people need to want to install and run the app. Yeah, that's really simple. But as you can see from this article here, more than seven in 10 Americans won't use contract tracing apps, the data shows. You know, if people don't want to use the app, then utterly we're spending all this time and energy on developing something that is useless. You can see from these numbers, if 38% of the population of a country run the app, as in Iceland, you'll detect 14.44% of the contacts. And if 12% of the people, as in Singapore, are running the app, you'll only detect 1.44% of the COVID cases. For 1.44% of the COVID cases, obviously this is not spectacular. Um, and this might give some of us a false sense of security by running this app, because oftentimes the app has a little pop-up saying, you are protected by the COVID safe app or whatever. And of course, uh, it's not protecting us at all. Another problem that we tend to have is false positives. So let's say that uh, I am in a classroom and uh, there's another person who is in the next classroom over and we are sitting on opposite sides of the wall. <laughs> well, you know, radio goes through walls. So, you know, it turns out that uh, we might actually seem like we're within close proximity to this person when we actually aren't. So, you know, and it turns out actually that these kinds of distance calculations using Bluetooth are really hard. <laughs> you know, there's walls, there's obstructions, there's reflections, there's putting a case on your cell phone. <laughs> you know, all of these things interfere with calculating the distance. So the problem is, if we're going to get all kinds of false positives from our app, you know, are people going to be expected to self-quarantine if they get a false alarm? Yeah, you only have to get a false alarm uh, and self-quarantine when you didn't need to once before people stop ignoring the app completely. Another issue uh, that we have with these uh, COVID-19 apps is security. And quite simply, these COVID-19 apps are software. Yeah, not very surprising. And all software has bugs, both functional bugs as well as security holes. And of course, this also extends to any number of Bluetooth bugs uh, that uh, already exist. There have already been several CVEs, so several reported vulnerabilities in COVID contract tracing apps, just because this is politically important and for public health does not mean that it's not going to face the same usual problems that every other app uh, handles. Another problem that is particular with these contact tracing apps is that they're using this Google Apple um, uh, API and because it handles the Bluetooth advertising and the scanning and the notification. Now, this uh, GAEN API is part of Google Play services. And the problem is that this Google Play services is super chunky. You know, there's so much stuff in there. In fact, all of the APIs for everything Google are all in the Google Play services, which means that the surface area, you know, for finding bugs is enormous. On top of this, it runs as root. I need not say more. There's also permissions. Uh, you also, as with many mobile apps, tend to get permission creep. Um, Android apps uh, in general, uh, and these COVID apps in particular, use several uh, different kinds of permissions, such as access find location, Bluetooth, and the Bluetooth admin uh, permission. Of course, there's a lot of other apps that also happen to use this, including advertising, weather, social media. And what can happen is that other non-contact tracing apps can actually build upon the data that's collected by the contact tracing app and then use this for other purposes. And of course, you know, as consumers, this is not quite what we signed up for. Um, there's also different ways that we can abuse these systems. For example, um, let's say that I am a artist, a performance artist. So I'm going to take my phone, I'm going to tie it to my dog, and I'm going to let it run around the public park, just to make a point. Or maybe I'm an activist, and I'm going to go to a Black Lives Matter rally, or maybe a Trump rally, and then, you know, send out all kinds of false alarms. Or maybe I'm a student that didn't study for my exam, so I can then uh, do a false alarm on the teacher. 
you know, or, you know, terrorism, etc. There is a lot of ways in which we can actually abuse this uh, situation. Um, it could be that there is a black market that is created for temporary IDs of those who are potentially infected, such as uh, patients from an IC or staff. You know, the uh, it could be that uh, Google and Apple could require uh, some kind of a magic number that you would get from uh, a COVID testing center. But the problem is so few people are getting tested that such a way of preventing abuse is not likely to be uh, effective. Oh, one more thing I want to say about this slide, by the way, is you can see this picture on the right is the card 10. So this is uh, a, a system used, also used for the badges at the, uh, by the Chaos Computer Club uh, for some of their conferences. And it turns out that they have actually written a COVID-19 exposure notification uh, emulator, basically, uh, that uh, interfaces with our card, uh, card 10 system, which means that hackers already have a hardware platform available that they can use for spoofing, uh, you know, these signals and playing around with it. So what can we build with this? I mean, can we build spoofers and fuzzers and, you know, there's all kinds of things we can do. And the hacker community is already busy with this. Um, other things that we might not have thought about, like side channel attack, like maybe for political reasons, you know, maybe let's say I'm a, I like Trump or something. Uh, maybe I want to know who are those chumps, you know, who have the, oh, the app installed. And maybe I want to go attack them or give them a hard time. You know, uh, it turns out that in Germany that somebody already developed an app that does nothing other than showing who actually installed the German Corona warning app. And it was developed by a politician. <laughs> this is obviously not the intention of these things. Um, other things that you can possibly do with these Corona apps, you know, they're beaconing all this information. You can actually do side channel analysis to do things like tell what kind of cell phone people are using. You know, hackers are starting to play with these things. We shouldn't be surprised. And of course, uh, with Corona, there's a lot of phishing attacks and, and scams also that we're increasingly seeing, you know, such as, you know, you're close to an infected person. Please enter your credentials here. Um, privacy wise. There's going to be a lot of function creep with these apps. So basically, uh, Care 19 is the COVID tracing app in uh, North Dakota, and it was found to be giving data to Foursquare uh, and Google. <laughs> um, one thing, by the way, also about the Google Play Store, like I was talking about with the trying to install this, um, you know, you you know, these things are not anonymous. They actually require uh, a Google account, you know, including email addresses, EMC numbers, uh, you know, telephone numbers. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff you can use, you know, this information for. Um, the second picture here is uh, there was a worry about the police in Minnesota who said that they were contact tracing demonstrators at a Black Lives Matter rally. Obviously, this is not the intention, you know, for contact tracing. But, you know, once this technology exists, it starts getting used for these things. Third picture, uh, in Bahrain, uh, there was a uh, contact tracing app that was sharing its data with a game show. Yeah, <laughs> the way that that worked is there was a game show that was calling random people to see if they were at home self-quarantining. And if they were, they would win a prize. <laughs> yeah. And the fourth picture is, um, you can see Auckland woman creeped out after a restaurant worker uses her contract dating, tracing details to hit on her. <laughs> yeah, again, none of this obviously is the intention of contact tracing, but the more that this technology is adopted, the more it's going to start getting used for things like this. Um, we need to ask questions about privacy and data retention is a really obvious question. You know, what happens to personal data and how long is it kept for? You know, S Singapore wants to keep the data forever for research purposes. Right. Uh, you know, and another problem is it's really easy to claim that this research data is anonymous when it actually is not. And remember that pseudo anonymous data does not mean it's actually anonymous. Because if you correlate it with uh, metadata, oftentimes you can trace it back uh, to the individuals. Other things that are important are like a sunset clause. You know, when will these contact tracing apps be discontinued? You know, when will the Google, Google Apple API be discontinued? And when is the data going to be deleted? You know, you could say, OK, we'll discontinue it when the pandemic ends. Will the pandemic ever end? Now, another issue is interoperability. 
a lot of countries are using the uh, Google API because they want to be able to interoperate, for example, across EU countries. So if I live in Switzerland and I cross the border to Germany, I want the same system to be able to work. This is all well and good, except for the fact you know, we need to ask ourselves, is interoperability a good thing when, you know, the goals and privacy protections across those different countries is different? You know, Singapore might not respect our data as much as the Netherlands does. So we need to be asking questions about this. Opt-in, <laughs> you know, I mean, we've got the GDPR, uh, which, of course, does have loopholes, by the way, for public safety uh, issues. But nonetheless, you know, in, in principle, we should to be compliant. We should be allowing people to opt in. But truthfully, is this really opt in? You know, this Google Apple API is pushed automatically in an update to all Apple and Android phones. So me, you know, if I am the owner of an Android phone, can I decide that I don't want the API? We can't. You know, and, and to me, that is not necessarily what I would consider to be opting in. Uh, there's also, of course, social pressure. You know, using these contact tracing apps is our duty. And, you know, if you don't do it, you're not patriotic. Anyway, uh, and on top of that, with self-reporting, you know, is that voluntary? You know, in some countries it might be. In other countries, maybe not. Um, anonymity. So I already mentioned uh, the Google Play Store uh, as well as the iStore that are uh, basically requiring you to have a Google account or an Apple account to be able to install this app. Now stop and think about this. You know, someone who has an Android that isn't running the Google Play Store cannot run a contact tracing app. Why should participating in public health require a Google account? Somebody can tell me this later. Uh, another uh, thing that we need to think about is de-anonymization. There's a lot of claims that these systems are anonymous, but again, pseudo-anonymous data is not completely anonymous once it is tied to me metadata. Uh, in centralized systems, uh, because the authorities know everything, they can create uh, contact graphs of people. Uh, and on top of that, there's this thing called the paparazzi attack. So let's say that I am stalking a particular celebrity, and then I collect the temporary ID from their cell phone. Then I check the bulletin board that's advertising the uh, list of infected people, and then I see that, hey, this celebrity now is infected. You know, of course, now I'm paparazzi. I'm going to publish this into the newspaper. I don't think that this is anonymity. I mean, this is not a widespread attack. It's a targeted attack, but it's still a serious one. Politics, <laughs> you know, let's think about source code. Is it open source? You know, some of these contact tracing apps are, but remember that these contact tracing apps oftentimes are thin wrappers around the Google Apple API. The Google Apple API is not open source. Why? Beats me, <laughs> you know? I mean, I personally think that something that is collecting this much personal data on people deserves to be independently audited. And this cannot happen without open source. You know, the EU right now is adopting the Google Apple uh, API without asking these kinds of questions. I don't know why. I mean, if you ask me, I think this is actually an opportunity right now for the EU to kind of prevent you know, these mega tech companies from throwing their uh, weight around. But, you know, the EU actually needs to want to do this, and it hasn't done it so far. Reverse engineering, uh, similarly, you know, uh, if you're trying to test it and you don't have the source code, then you need to reverse engineer it. You can see a picture right here of a repository where somebody is doing this. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, that is also uh, against the terms of services and also sometimes illegal. So this is really tricky. You can't make modifications also, you know, because there's a single Apple signing key for these apps and only one of them is given for country. So we can't even make our own variations of this app if we want to. Uh, so we need to ask these questions about anti-competition. You know, if Google and Apple are collaborating and throwing their weight around, you know, is this OK? Are they trying? It seems like they're trying to take on functions of the government, like healthcare, education, you know these kinds of things. Do we want this? Other political issues, you know, is the money that we're spending like the 68 million on the German Corona Warren app effective, given that the app might not work <laughs> and it might be causing more problems that it's creating, you know? We need to ask this question. Other political questions, 
Will the app be used to convince working class people that they are safe enough to go back to work? You know, when the middle class of us are on Zoom and, and the rich of us, you know, are in their country homes collecting dividends. You know, and similarly, we need to think about the emergency powers that we're giving right now to collect all this information and think about how easy it is to take them back later. So as techies, you know, we're getting involved in the deployment of a possibly unethical and definitely untested medical device, which possibly could do more harm than good. Is this OK? You know, as the tech community, we need to be asking ourselves these questions. And furthermore, should we be held responsible if and when things go wrong? So as Radically Open Security, we're looking into these issues. And I mentioned earlier, we're working with both the Dutch ministry and the EU on testing these apps. So I do want to present the review facility to you, uh, which is an initiative of the e European Commission, Radically Open Security and NLNet. Um, if you go to reviewfacility.eu, uh, you can have a look. Uh, it has a forum on which we can discuss these kinds of issues. And there is also a chat function in which we are actually performing uh, audits on these various apps. Uh, it's good to get more perspectives and more people looking on it. Not everything is open, but we're trying to make things as open as possible. So you can go to participate.reviewfacility.eu uh, to, to, to come and help out and be part of this. So um, yeah, so this is, uh, I guess, the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions uh, if there are any. And for the rest, you know, we need to do our part to try and make sure that this technology, it looks like it's going to be uh, deployed, you know, but if it is, we have to try our best to make it responsible, <laughs> you know, at least make it not, a, a, you know, a security disaster. And yeah, I hope that this presentation has been thought provoking for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Are there Melody. Any questions? We really enjoyed that talk. Yes, the, we had one Thank question you. coming in. The question is: Is okay. the backend going to be open source, or the only one doing code auditing will be the government? Yeah. So, uh, in the case of the Dutch uh, Corona Melder, uh, it, it it is open source. Uh, but again, it's it's mostly a thin wrapper uh, around uh, around this Google Apple. Right now, we are in conversation with Google and Apple. <laughs> uh, and when I say we, I mean uh, the review facility and also the European Commission. And we are asking them if they can open source, you know, the code. And we're also asking them if they can, you know, honestly, it's, I, I don't want to say too much because, of course, you know, I'm, I'm also working on this as a business thing. But what I can say is that even, you know, getting Google and Apple to, sign pen test waivers is already complicated enough. So probably asking them to uh, also open source uh, the code is probably more than I think the EU is willing to push for. <laughs> so I'm not necessarily happy with this, but, you know, again, this is completely a political issue. And I think the only way to solve this is, you know, to convince somebody with a lot of power to, to push hard on these companies to open source it. Yep, agreed. Um so I cannot see that I don't have my computer in front of me, but we have our friends moderating the chats. So if you have any other questions, please uh, feel free to reach us out on Twitter or on our Slack. Um, and or we, you can always email us and we'll try to make, make sure that we reach out to our speakers and get to the answers that you wish for. Uh, but thanks again, Melanie, so much. It was a pleasure having you and speaking to us about uh, such an important topic at this time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, for Melanie. Me. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks. Perfect. So thank I you. think uh, then we're already uh, ready for our next speaker. Um, we we uh, want to welcome... Uh, I. Okay, quick break. Hi, 